Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the American Civil War Museum. My name is Stephanie Arduini. I'm the Director of Education here at the museum. And thank you for coming out on a warm but beautiful May evening for our talk of, or this talk of the Foundry series called Combat, Racial Violence, and Resilience, featuring Dr. Stephen Goldman and Dr. Kadato Williams. Dr. Stephen A. Goldman is a psychiatrist with more than 30 years experience in academic and clinical medicine and public health, and with a particular interest in the effects of war. He is an adjunct assistant professor of psychiatry at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, and he's a fellow of the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine and a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Dr. Goldman is also a two-time past president of the New Jersey Civil War Roundtable and a longstanding member of the Abraham Lincoln Institute Board of Directors. He is, a, he is completing a two-volume work about the impact of combat and military service on veterans' lives and the vital yet undervalued role of Union soldiers and sailors in support of freedom, reconstruction, and racial equality. Please help me welcome Dr. Stephen Goldman. Thank you. Uh, absolute pleasure to be here. It's amazing when you do research and you find out what's true and not true. Um, while Bill Hickok was not holding aces and eights, by the way, the dead man's hand, sorry. One of the truisms was that Abraham Lincoln both invented the term and used the term thinking bayonets. Not only did Abraham Lincoln not coin the term, I can't find any evidence that he actually used the term other than historians saying that he did. The term was actually coined by Napoleon, and it wasn't a complimentary term, because what Napoleon said, that government should be where when bayonets should learn to think. So it was pejorative for Napoleon how he felt about his soldiers. What's fascinating about that is the Union soldiers were called thinking bayonets during the Civil War, and that was extremely positive. For example, October 3rd, 1864, the Daily National Republican. But with us, far from being a subject of fear, it is our glory and pride that for the war for the Union has been upheld by a million thinking bayonets. Union soldiers, black and white, were a unique fighting force in the history of the United States. They were truly a citizen's army. They were predominantly volunteers. It was unprecedented in size and diversity in terms of that. And you had two um, separate groups who learned a tremendous amount about each other during the four years of the war. There were nearly 2.5 million white soldiers who served in the war, one quarter of them born outside the United States. And contrary to popular belief, the vast majority were literate. For example, Edmund Arnold was almost 22 years old, a painter in Massachusetts, when Sumter was fired upon. And he, quote, felt as did millions of others that the lamp of American liberty must go out. It should be set amid the roar of cannon and the din of battle. Coming generations should not reproach us for being too imbecile to preserve the precious legacy bequeathed to us by our forefathers. Edmund Arnold goes to war with the 15th Massachusetts on July 12, 1861. By four months later, he's lost his right arm at Balls Bluff, Virginia. Ezra Hiltz, 22-year-old farmer from upstate New York, enlisted in August of 1861, lost his right forearm at the Wilderness, May 5, 1862. The war was just ending when he wrote, as a nation we had sinned. We claimed to be what we were not, a nation of free men granting equal rights to all men, when at the same time we held nearly four million human beings in the bonds of slavery. The wicked, ambitious spirit which begot and sought to perpetuate slavery, begot the wicked rebellion, and this, as a natural result, begot that other monstrous crime, assassination, which draped the world, we may almost say, in mourning. Our sin was great. Our punishment has been severe, but have we not repented? Have we not set the captive free? I think we could classify these men as thinking bayonets. Then there were the African-American soldiers. During the first two years of the war, there were isolated black soldiers in individual regiments. But as you know, they were not recruited and did not count against quotas for the states in terms of recruitment. They'd never been banned from naval service, which is interesting. So they were serving in the Navy, an integrated Navy, in the beginning of the war, but there was a quota, 5% quota. 
By the end of the war, approximately 180,000 men of color served in the Army, along with over 7,000 white officers. Now, the composition of the African-American soldier in the Union is very interesting. 20% came from northern free states. Another one quarter came from border states that either stayed in the Union, for example, Maryland and Delaware, along with the District of Columbia. The other, approximately 54%, came from Confederate states. The literacy rate of the free men of color from the North approximated that of white soldiers, approximately 90%. For the most part, given the tremendous legal uh, bans of having slaves learn to read and write, most of them were illiterate, but they learned while they were in the service. Very different motivations for emancipated or manumitted slaves or runaway slaves to the Union lines who joined the Army, as opposed to the free men of color. The former slaves were quite literally fighting for their own freedom. An example, John, Hick, John Henry Pinckney of the 4th USCT was from Maryland. He enlisted in Baltimore in July 1863, quote, with the hopes of gaining my liberty, as well as that of my whole race, I now begin to think I've accomplished my most sanguine expectations. He lost his right leg at Deep Bottom, September 29, 1864. A devastating wound, but he saw it as worth it. Quote, I have lost a leg in the effort which I freely give for the benefit of the generation to come. John Henry Pinckney did not write those words. He spoke those words to a white northern soldier who had served with him, and he wrote them for him, because John Henry Pinckney, at the time, was illiterate. He did not stay illiterate. He went to a free school in Maryland, and he later became a, um, a fairly successful, in some ways, uh, businessman there on the Eastern Shore. Then there were the free men of color. For example, Robert Pinn, uh, a farmer from Maslin, Ohio, who was born free. He wanted to enlist in 1861, but the governor of Ohio wouldn't allow black soldiers to enlist in 1861. Later, Pinn wrote, I was very eager to become a soldier in order to prove by my feeble efforts the black man's rights to untrammeled manhood. Bear in mind, these men had common school educations. And listen to the way they write. I was denied admission to the ranks of the loyalists on account of my color not being of that kind which is considered a standard in this country. He actually did go to war in 1861. He went as a servant to an officer in one of the Ohio regiments, and apparently he fought at Shiloh. He literally picked up a musket and fought. Officially, he joined the 127th Ohio, which later became the 5th United States Colored Troops. So Robert Pinn went to war in September 1863. He also became one of the first men of color ever to be awarded the Medal of Honor. What were the attitudes of white soldiers towards African American troops? They were tremendously different as time went on. It's one of the most unacknowledged facts, quite frankly, is the radicalization of white northern troops along with African American troops. An example, Comrade Dipple, a private from the 37th Wisconsin, was on his way to get his right arm amputated at City Point when, quote, I saw rebel prisoners encamped along the roadside in an open field guarded by United States colored troops in double file. This gave me the greatest satisfaction. I forgot all my suffering, reflecting how quickly providence turns the luck of man and does justice to every one. Wilbur Fisk, 2nd Vermont, talked about the fact that he thought it was completely unfair that blacks could not be commissioned. As you know, most black troops, were, well, they were commanded by white officers. Eventually, 100 black officers were commissioned during the war, predominantly um, ministers and physicians and others. Most of them, frankly, were in the Massachusetts 54th and 55th. By the way, Massachusetts 54th and 55th were the first regiments of free men from the North. There was the first South Carolina, which were predominantly slaves, commanded by Thomas Higginson. What's interesting is the composition of the Massachusetts 54th were not predominantly from Massachusetts. They came from everywhere, including a high proportion, by the way, from the state of Ohio, in terms of that. What about the view of black troops by Southern soldiers? As Richard Slotkin wrote in his brilliant book, No Quarter, The Battle of the Crater, the only Civil War battles in which regular force refused to grant quarter involved Confederate and black troops. Neither one gave quarter. Literally, they took no prisoners. Lieutenant Colonel Rufus Dawes, commander of the legendary 6th Wisconsin of the Iron Brigade, wrote, a little to the right of us are Burnside's Negroes occupying trenches. 
master and slave meet on equal terms, and the hostility is implacable. They fire day and night on both sides without secession. There is retribution justice in the history they are making. Pym was right about a lot of things. The only thing he was wrong about is not all of Burnside's men were former slaves. Matter of fact, among Burnside's men were Dawes' fellow Ohioans who were free men of color. What else went on during the Civil War? The government did not announce emancipation as a war aim in 1861. The aim was to restore the Union. Everybody knew what underlay the Civil War was chattel slavery. And the, th the event that really not just set the torch uh, was before Lincoln's election. We want to talk about uh, unexpected consequences. The Compromise of 1850 lit the Civil War by the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law that galvanized previously ambivalent people in the North because now by law you were a slave catcher. And if you want to see something marvelous, take a look at that great show that's on WGN about the Freedom Trail and some of the writings. And there are documented examples in Pennsylvania, New York, uh, Troy, New York, uh, parts in Canada of white uh, citizens literally holding off U.S. Marshals from taking escaped slaves from the areas there. And of course, the most famous example was what happened in Massachusetts in 1854 when Anthony Burns was found, an escaped slave from Virginia. I see heads nodding. It's an, I, if people have asked me if you can go back, I want to go back to that moment in 1854. First, they tried to break him out of jail. Thomas Higginson and free African Americans used a battering ram to try and get him out. They couldn't do that. They were forced to bring in the U.S. Marines to walk him back to slavery while 50,000 Bostonians lined the streets and had to be held back by the military. A year later, thankfully, Anthony Burns came back to Massachusetts a free man because they bought his freedom from the Free African American Society of Massachusetts. 1864, the war has become a war for freedom and a war to restore the Union. What happens with the soldiers' vote? People kind of took this for granted. Soldiers had never voted in the field before. The state of New Jersey made sure that the election stayed with the Democrats by not allowing soldiers to vote in the field. They had to return to New Jersey. By the way, McClellan state at that point. So what happened was when they were allowed to vote in the field, they voted overwhelmingly for Abraham Lincoln. Against whom? Who was his opponent in 1864? George McClellan, Little Mac, the hero of the Army of the Potomac. He didn't get the votes in the Army of the Potomac, much less than the rest. So what had, what had taken place? White Northern soldiers had completely bought into the, pro to the prospect that they were an obvious liberation. There was something more than union going on here. There was a greater purpose going on here. And they did buy into this. And they re-enlisted in numbers that nobody anticipated. And what did they sign on for? The worst year of the war to come was 1864 and early 1865. The war ends. Slavery is over. And of course, 13th Amendment has been ratified. But there were more than 600,000 northern soldiers, soldiers who were dead, along with over 300,000 who were wounded. Like everything else in the Civil War, no one had anticipated this. So American veterans had come home before, but never in these numbers, which dwarfed all previous numbers. Never so many with a high proportion of debilitating injuries, and nobody was prepared for this. But there's also something else, and I know we have veterans in the audience as always. The story never changes. You come back from war and you are different. And not different always in ways that are negative, which we'll talk about, but you're different. There was a great expression from the Civil War. What did they say when they went to war during the Civil War time? You're going to see the elephant. I love that. It's an amazing expression. Well, they'd seen the elephant. They'd seen sights that they could never have imagined, but there was something else they had seen and done. They'd seen and done things they could not believe themselves capable positive and negative. The Vietnam vet and screenwriter William Broyles, Jr., you can come back from war broken in mind or body or not come back at all. But if you come back whole, you bring with you the knowledge you have explored regions of your soul that in most men will always remain uncharted. I'm a psychiatrist. I have had the honor of treating men and women who have gone to war. And I go back a ways. I've even treated, believe it or not, early in my career, a couple of World War I veterans who were in one of the units. My old friend, Dr. Shelley Klinger, we did our residency together, and treated World War II, Korean War, all the way through, working with Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. 
But combat and military service is not monolithic. You must know the shadings of that. Let's start with the horror. To tell the pain and suffering that is endured on the battlefield, I could not, is beyond human mind to express or pen the horrors which are endured. No mind can realize it, no heart can feel the anguish, except those who have passed through the toll and danger of a soldier. Private David Dorsh Ively, 114th Pennsylvania, lost his arm at Gettysburg. August 13, 1862. Passing over to where the rebel lines had been formed, a revolting sight met my view. There the dead were only partly buried. Feet and hands protruded from their shallow graves, left exposed or prey to the hungry vultures. I turned away full of sadness with a silent but fervent prayer that the cruel strife would cease. I desired to visit no more battlefields. Private John, John Bryson, 30th New York, lost his arm at Bull Run. He later became the superintendent of Cypress Hill Cemetery in Brooklyn, which is a veteran cemetery. But there's two other aspects to war that make people uncomfortable. And it's one of the things that veterans find hard when they come home. Nothing approaches the grandeur and thrill of combat. For example, the morning of May 4, 1864, so long blue lines of infantry where bristling burnished steel gleamed in the sunlight. Before, before me, I saw the entire Army of the Potomac making a crossing. 700,000 men, 70,000 men were in line and in full view. You could simply imagine what this looked like. Men who watched the uh, charge, Pettigrew and, um, um, I can't believe I'm bugging this, um, the charge at Gettysburg, never forgot the sight of 13,000 members of the Army of Northern Virginia coming at them, thinking they were coming at them individually in terms of that. That was Phil Fork, 11 Pennsylvania. But then there's the thrill of combat. An American World War II pilot who had survived 50 missions, never did I feel so much alive. Never did the earth nor the surroundings look so bright. I had my life. Captain William Hudson of the 49th New York lost his arm at Spotsylvania. Who can tell a soldier's feelings, his joy on the eve of his first victory? My soul is stirred even now with my rapture as I think of it. That's the duality. And I don't think anyone's ever expressed it better than Private Edward Jennings, 130th New York, who lost his arm at Deserted Farm. The pyrotechnic display in the midnight darkness possessed all the elements of sublimity and terror. By the fitful light of bursting shells can be seen the ghastly features of sublimity of the dead and dying, and the ground strewn with slain horses, while riderless ones galloped over field, trampling friend, foot, and foe. Tim O'Brien, the gifted Vietnam veteran and writer. War is hell, but that's not the half of it. Because war is mystery and terror and adventure and courage and discovery, holiness, pity, despair, longing, and love. War is nasty, war is fun, war is thrilling, war is drudgery. War makes you a man, war makes you dead. This is the reality we have. We live with millions of our, of our fellow civilians, settled citizens who have been to war. There's no light that shines on them that points them out to us. But we must know about the experience because coming home and reintegrating is all of our obligations in relation to that. And if we make the military and combat experience so foreign, we make it that much harder for the veterans to return and that people understand what it's like to do that. And again, I've been very ardent and lucky in my career to have worked with veterans now going on more than 30 years in relation to that. And it's not just Vietnam vets and Civil War soldiers. Have people seen the marvelous uh, miniseries The Pacific on HBO? One of the greatest things I've ever seen one of the books and one of the soldiers was Eugene Sledge. The last episode of that series is the finest thing I've ever seen, other than best years of our lives, on the soldiers coming home. And he talked about his last goodbye to the men that he'd literally slept with, defecated with, fought with, shared with, and survived with. And there's that great scene where his close friend Snafu doesn't even say goodbye to him as he leaves the train and then 30 years later he reads his book and they reconnect and he ended up a pallbearer at his funeral. What Sledge talks about is love. O'Brien talked about love. In the great film Platoon, for me my favorite scene is just before the final firefight when Charlie Sheen and Keith David, who's got 10 days in a wake up and he gets his orders, 
and they hug, and he tells me he's going to walk him out. It's one of the most beautiful scenes in the film. Two men who would never have interacted in civilian life. They came from completely different worlds. But when you're a grunt, when you're at the front, that's why white northern soldiers gain tremendous respect for African-American soldiers, not because African-American soldiers had learned to kill, which is what the great W.B. Du Bois said. It's because they had shared the same um, threats. They'd gone through the same thing. And once you've shared that, you feel very differently about a man in relation to that. Now, what was the veteran facing when they came home from the Civil War? First of all, there's no GI Bill. An embryonic um, pension system, no VA. Uh, many tens of thousands were addicted to morphine and opiates. And venereal disease. With my favorite quote from the Civil War, a night with Venus, a lifetime with Mercury. The completely, <laughs> completely useless treatment of venereal disease with mercurials. But there was also something else, and the men knew it. People were terrified of them. Sound familiar? William Penn Sands. Many of my fellow citizens were fearful that the scattering of so many men, unused for years through the routine of civilian life, might result in turmoils and commotions at home. John Stewart, 3rd New Jersey. It has been a painful experience of many of us to find a sentiment prevailing among many that with our return, there'll be an increase of crime con consequent to the demoralization of camp life. Then there were others who within three months discovered homeless veterans wandering the streets of Boston and New York begging. Three months. This, again, these are not new issues I'm pointing out. And as Joseph Wallagare pointed out, Major Joseph Wallagare, the sight of a poor soldier with one arm, one leg, standing on a street corner begging with his two little children is not a spectacle calculated to inspire our youth with patriotism, convince them of the honor which attends those who nobly do battle for the republic. But as study after study has shown, we need not fear the veteran. Most veterans, the last thing they want to do is ever pick up a gun or act aggressively. They've seen enough violence. And there's a great studies that showed this because they have seen life taken in every possible way. They've also seen the best of people in other ways. And life becomes that much more precious to them. In a film I didn't like in a lot of ways, but in other ways is very valid, is the great scene in Deer Hunter when Deer Hunter, the, the title character is Robert De Niro. If you haven't seen it, he comes back. He's the one-shot purist. Do you remember what happens when he comes back to hunt at home? Do you remember the scene I'm talking about? He won't pull the trigger. And it's not anti-hunting. The same thing happened to Sledge, which they showed in that last episode. He never picked up a gun ever again because the value of life had taken over and the importance of it. So although you're trained to kill, although that's what a soldier does, that doesn't translate into civilian life. And the taking of life in war does not translate into civilian life. Because the taking of life in war is a sanctioned killing. Notice I don't use the word murder. By the way, if you read the original writings of the Old Testament, the commandment doesn't say, in the original Aramaic, it does not say thou shalt not kill. It says thou shalt not murder. They are not the same. They are not the equivalent. Atrocity is a murder. Killing within the bounds of the rules of law is killing. It is not considered murder. That's a tremendous distinction to be made. And that's an important distinction to be made for when these people come home and have to live with the consequences of that. And for the most part, like Charlie Hogue's written about this beautifully, used to run the PTSD unit at um, Walter Reed, that we sometimes superimpose our guilt onto those who have fought. That's not your job as a therapist. Your job as a therapist is to listen what they think, what they believe in terms of that. And we can talk more about that during the, the break. What are the themes that I have found in my research? Soldiers are forged from civilians through the crucibles of combat and military service. They are tremendously grateful that they're alive. And by the way, survivor guilt is not the only thing that occurs by having survived. Along with survival comes the obligation to live for those who have not lived. The great example of that is the magnificent monument, the Vietnam War Memorial, which originally, if you remember, people didn't like. It was too stark. Now, of course, it's a holy site. And uh, yes, I, I, I realize that. That's an aspect. You are obligated to live a full life because you've been saved from the fate of others in terms of that. 
But there's something else that I'll focus on the last five minutes, and again, we'll talk further about, and that's the, the warrior identity. The identity that one has, having survived war, you can survive anything. And for the men of the Union, white and black, they accepted the obligation of carrying on the unfinished work, that unfinished work from the Gettysburg Address. What was the unfinished work after the Civil War? African-American equality. Equality and opportunity for all Americans. And one of the most underwritten about, and I'm hoping to change that with my books, is the politicization, radicalization, and tremendous political power wielded by white and black Union veterans throughout the entire 19th century. There was only one national organization of any size that refused to draw a color line. Does anyone know what that national organization was? The Grand Army of the Republic, the Union Veterans National Organization. And that's a tremendous story that we can get into during that. So where does that leave us? They worked for the Freedmen's Bureau. They worked for other issues. They voted for Republicans in the days when they were Lincoln Republicans. And they were devastated when Reconstruction failed. And that's where some of the cynicism came in. But did they eventually lose their feeling of why they had fought? I suggest they didn't. I'll give you an example. In, 1980, in 1881, a Union veteran was elected to Congress from Ohio. He took the oath December 5th. December 13th, he said, when I was young, slavery was the sin that threatened our nation. I went to war to kill slavery. He had one more obligation to perform before he took a seat in Congress. I went today to the Shrine of the Dead. I went over to Arlington Cemetery. This is a letter to his wife. I found every grave and stood beside it with uncovered head. All young men who fell at my side under my command. For what they died, I fight a little longer. Over the graves, I get inspiration to stand for all they won in establishing our government upon freedom, equality, justice, liberty, and protection to the humblest. That was Rufus Dawes. And that's what he did. He only had one term in Congress, by the way. But that's what he did. His last act was to vote against the Chinese Exclusion Act. But what happened in the 19th century applies to the 20th and 21st century. And I'll leave you with this last veteran. And this is a veteran who served in another civil war 100 years later, but it wasn't his country's civil war. His civil war was thousands of miles away. The war is over for me now, but will always be there the rest of my days. Those of us who did make it have an obligation to build again, to teach to others what we know, and to try with the rest of our lives to find a goodness and a meaning to this life. If you don't recognize it, it's the words that conclude platoon. And if you don't know that, Oliver Stone was a Bronze Star, an Oak Cluster, Purple Heart Awardee, spent 15 months in country. I can't think of a better manifestation of the soldier's pride and the warrior identity. I thank you. I'll be glad to take any questions at the end. Thank you, Stephen. So our next speaker, Dr. Kadada E. Williams, is an associate professor of history at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, who investigates African Americans' experiences of and responses to racial violence, including rape, night riding, and lynching. She is the author of They Left Great Marks on Me, The Wounds That Cried Out, and The Aftermaths of Lynching, research that has support been supported by the Ford Foundation. Williams is completing a book on night riding's impacts on families transitioning from slavery to freedom after the Civil War. Please help me welcome Dr. Kadata Williams. Thank you all for coming out. Hopefully this is going to play in the background without any assistance from me. Um, we'll see how that works. Uh, make sure I turn it on. Okay. It started as a normal winter day in Chatham County, North Carolina, just outside of a little hamlet called Bevan. Essex Harris worked a full shift on the railroad, cutting new ground before going home to his wife, Anne, four of their children, and a nephew who was staying with them helping out on the farm. The Harrises completed their daily chores, enjoyed dinner, and then went to bed. A knock on the door in the middle of the night woke Anne, who shook Essek awake and told him there's somebody at the door. Essek jumped out of bed, but before he could even get to the door, 
a gang of white men burst into their home. The men were armed, and the size of the group must have shocked Essek, who answered their questions politely and followed all of their commands. Essek explained, my house was nearly full of them, and there was a parcel of them standing in the door. The men demanded that Essek turn over his gunpowder and gun, which like most Southerners, he used for hunting and personal protection. Being outnumbered and outgunned, Essek complied, and the men left, leaving the family alarmed but unharmed. Things would not go as well when they returned. A short time later, the barking of their dog alerted Ann to the men's return. Ann knew it was them and told Essek when she woke him. He peeked out of the window and discovered his yard full of armed white men. Essek quickly extinguished the fire, grabbed his newly acquired gun, but before he could do anything, the men broke through one of the windows and started firing inside. Essek explained to members of the Congressional Committee investigating the Ku Klux Klan in 1871 that in what would be a strike that lasted for more than an hour, quote, I don't reckon there was five minutes time when they were not shooting. When the shooting started, Essek crawled away from the windows into a corner. Anne got under their mattress. All of the children scrambled under a bed. The family remained quiet except for the baby, who Essex said just cried and cried and cried and then suddenly didn't cry anymore. The others didn't make a fuss at all, even while shots were flying all over where they were. I felt it to be life and death anyhow, he said. I thought my wife and children were all dead. I did not expect anything else. Essek was wounded in several places, including his arm, which he could hardly use. But he aimed his gun and fired at one of the men, striking him in the chest. Essex's shot did not kill the man he hit, but it did give his attackers reason to pause. He listened as they debated their next move. They discussed setting the house on fire with them inside, an act that would have forced the family to face the fire or the men. I have often heard people talk about how a man, uh, about a man being so scared that he could not shoot people, Essek explained. For they had been there so long, my fear was over. I had no fear at all by that time. Believing he didn't have anything else to lose but his life, Essek reloaded his gun with a stronger load fired again, which drove the men away. The Harrises were one of several thousand African-American families targeted by Knight Riders uh, after the Civil War. These strikes typically involved uh, gangs of, um, these are par paramilitary gangs, of heavily armed and sometimes masked white men terrorizing African-American communities after the Civil War. Some of them were formal members of the Ku Klux Klan, and others were not, but they embraced the group's ideology and their activities. These men invaded African Americans' homes in the middle of the night. They stalked families, looking to catch them off guard when they thought they were safe and unprepared for battle. They held families hostage for hours at a time, whipping, raping, torturing, and murdering them. The entire Harris family lived through the strike, but other families were not as fortunate. So I've been researching these stories of African Americans who testify before the Congressional Committee. And their testimonies reveal how African American victims of this violence understood what happened and tried to communicate it. And what I argue is that they try to communicate the unmaking of their families as a result of what happened to them during these strikes. To highlight the human toll of this violence, let me give you a better sense of how survivors describe attacks. It was the thunder of the hooves breaking the silence of the night that jarred, jarred Caroline Benson awake and alerted her that her family was in danger. For Jackson Surratt, it was the sound of men's bodies crashing through his door. For others, it was the blast of gunshot coming through their walls or the screams coming from their neighbors' yards. What these families heard was the men coming for them. Abram Brumfield saw the disguised men coming for him with their guns in hand. Hannah and Samuel Tutson's three children, who were all under 10, sat watching from the woods. 
as the men whipped and assaulted their parents. Augustus Blair also watched. In his case, it was in stunned silence as a gang beat and repeatedly stabbed his son, Billy. Charlotte Fowler watched too as her husband Wallace's brain matter seeped out of his head whenever he breathed as he lay dying on the floor. The things that victims saw stuck with them for the rest of their lives. Houses inundated with gunfire like the Harris's reeked of soot, excuse me, inundated with gunfire reeked of gunpowder, and the houses that are set on fire smelled of soot. Homes where victims were fatally wounded held the whiff of metal until the family could wash away the blood. For weeks after the attack on her, Hannah Tutson smelled the alcohol a deputy sheriff poured over her as he sexually assaulted her. Knowing these kinds of details about what happened when the Ku Klux Klan is critical for understanding the racial atrocities of Reconstruction. I think night rides are sometimes best understood as today's home invasions. Racial vigilantes wanted a confrontation with their victims. Confrontation over what, you might ask? Were black families seeking revenge for slavery? No. Were they raiding white people's property? No. Even the white people who testified before Congress, some of them said, I have no reason why, I have no understanding why they attacked him. Were black men raping white women? No. So what had they done that merited being stalked, held hostage, and subjected to these games of horror? Wallace Fowler challenged a white boy who was eating and destroying the produce he grew to support his family. Hannah and Samuel Tutson refused to abandon land they rightfully owned. They had the paperwork. They refused to abandon the land so white men could claim it. Doc Roundtree declined a white man's demands that he place his children into an apprenticeship with him. These are seemingly harmless things, right? Many survivors thought so too. When congressional investigators asked victims if they had done anything to provoke the men, they consistently answered no. Like most captives, a lot of them see themselves as going about the business of life after the war and life after slavery. People are working, they're assuming responsibility for providing for their families, they're voting and holding office, they're acquiring land, they're creating schools for their children. You know, the things that free people do. What African Americans came to realize is that the seemingly innocuous things that they were doing to make freedom real challenged whites seeking to maintain white supremacy. Racial white conservatives of the South saw black people voting in elections and striving to elevate themselves over slavery as a threat and worked to snatch that threat out by the roots. The Ku Klux were angry about losing the Civil War and seeing African Americans enjoy the benefits of citizenship. They robbed families of their land, of cash, of crops, and other personal valuables. Planters even rallied to um, drive sharecroppers off the land before they could collect their contracted portion of the crop. To regain political power, conservatives routinely assassinated progressive politicians and voters. Whatever their agendas, night riders were guided by an insistence on retaining any of the vestiges of slavery they could. They were not satisfied to do it politically at the ballot box. They resorted to terror and violence. Vigilantes were always armed. Rather than tangle with the U.S. Army, they preferred attacking civilians where they were most vulnerable, with their families, at home, in bed, at night. Instead of confronting their black adversaries man to man or militia to militia or even saying, let's gather on the hill at noon, they chose blitz attacks and sought to overwhelm their opponents. It is not advancing, you all didn't tell me. Night riders conflicted, inflicted considerable harm because of when and where they struck. They capitalized on gaps of federal oversight, striking away from army outposts. Their attacks were sporadic, lasting for days at a time often dissipating before U.S. troops, if there were any available, could even be rallied. 
Ku Klux came from all levels of conservative white society. They were doctors and lawyers, planters and yeoman farmers, poor landless whites, and elected officials. They enjoyed enthusiastic support from many of the white people in their communities, although not all, we should be clear about that. But the level of support they enjoyed made it easier for them to do harm with impunity. Gang's disruption of elections eventually prompted federal, uh, a federal intervention and a string of arrests, which resulted in the diminishing of strikes. Congress's 1871 Joint Select Committee investigation was part of this larger process. Let's see. Concern about political violence and the legal setting of the hearings informed investigators' questions about attacks. Conservatives were not interested in upending the forces that allowed ex-Confederates to return to political power. Progressives were more likely to give witnesses free reign to tell their stories of victimization at the hands of white assailants. African Americans had their own priorities. They told lawmakers the details of experiencing earth-shattering attacks where neither escape nor resistance was always possible. They cried in the witness box about loved ones killed during strikes. Survivors put their physically abused bodies into evidence to show what happened to them. In telling their stories, these black Southerners reported enduring a wide range of physical, psychological, and economic injuries. Night riding rarely touched people gently. Hannah Tutson described herself as being, quote, just raw from her whipping and sexual assault during the attack on her family. She said her womb came down as a result of the rape that she endured. Tutson's baby was also injured when one of the men snatched the child from its mother's arms and threw it across the cabin. The child struggled to walk thereafter without pain. Many survivors testified about injuries that put them or loved ones out of commission. Jesse Brown, a veteran whom Knight Riders attacked in Alabama, was kicked in the head by a man wearing a boot spur. Brown testified that the doctors treating him said that the cut just missed his brain pan any deeper and it would have killed him. Brown did not immediately, he did not indicate any formal treatment the doctors provided beyond the initial consultation, but he said that it took him six months to get up off his feet and get back to work. More than a year later, Brown was still experiencing pain. He testified, it pains me now. It still bothers me a heap now. Victims also indicated injuries that left them alive, but their bodies permanently disabled. South Carolinian Daniel Lipscomb testified, they beat me that way for nothing, and my fingers on this arm will never get right in the world. My fingers have no feeling. Georgian, uh, Georgian Abram Colby was unable to work as a barber or hauling wood because of the injuries he sustained, including his left hand, which he said was of not much use to me anymore now. Short and long-term physical debilitation made it harder for survivors to work for their families, which, made it, uh, which forced them to live on a lot less than they had before they were attacked. They broke me totally up. Mississippian James Hicks told investigators, I had to come away with nothing. Hicks's statement points to some of the widespread dev economic devastation many uh, night riding captors, uh, captives experience. Night riders destroyed African Americans' crops and their property. They stole their cash and even their land. Continued threats to their lives and the fact that a lot of perpetrators are still running loose in the community forced many survivors to flee their homes and communities. To get out safely, most people left immediately with only the things that they could carry. Warren Jones testified, I gathered up what I could in my arms and with my wife and child, I came away. William Coleman and his family quickly deserted their land and the home he built on it. He reported, I have lost my year's crop. His crop was still in the ground, didn't have enough time to get it out and my land and everything else. I can't get anything for it or do anything about it. 
Survivors also testified about wounds of the mind. For many of them, the sudden and incomprehensible nature of attacks, combined with knowing and sometimes not knowing who attacked them and why, were sources of great distress for survivors. Strikes left witnesses restless and anxious. After they whipped me, William Ford said, I never rested satisfied. Families whose loved ones were killed during strikes suffered from overwhelming grief. Even if a family member lived through a strike, night riding left everyone unsettled. Witnesses also discussed situations in which they knew someone died because of the horrors they experienced. Abram Colby blamed the strike on his little girl's death. She never got over it until she died, he explained. He remarked that her death, more than anything the men did to him, was what grieved him most of all. When he talked about his daughter's death and his wife's shortly thereafter, Abram explained, quote, they broke something inside of me, indicating the totalizing effects of the strikes. John Thomason was away when Night Riders came for him, shooting through his family's bedroom wall. I know their intention was to kill whoever was lying in the bed, John explained. Then they went around and shot close to the window, and they missed my wife's head by three inches. They scared her so that she died in July. Patrick Tanner's wife, Missouri, was confined to bed after giving birth when the vigilante struck their family. They have injured my wife so that I believe she will never get over it, Patrick explained. And this theme, never get over it, I'll never get over it, I don't think he ever got over it, I don't think we'll ever get over it, is a refrain throughout the hearings. Another one is fear of being struck again. Daniel Lipscomb testified, if I hear a stick crack, I'm watching to see if they're coming to get me again. He also recognized that the fear was not his own. He was living with it, and so were the rest of his family. They worried about being hit again. And he said, I have been stung once, and even a burnt child is smart enough to fear the fire the next time they encounter it. Night riding was intended to demonstrate to African Americans that they had no place or protection in post-war Southern society. Witnesses' accounts indicate that they received the message. Some survivors reported attacks to white patrons or local authorities. Some arrests were made, but most perpetrators were not prosecuted, or if they were, they were found not guilty, intensifying survivors' feelings of objection. Others didn't bother reporting at all because authorities had participated in the atrocities or refused to endanger their lives to bring them to an end. Hilliard Bush explained, I knew it was no use for me to go before an officer there. If I had done anything with them and then had gone back home, they would have killed me. That is what they do. They always abuse people after they get back home if they go before the officers. And so this is Abram Colby's statement when he testifies before Congress on uh, October 27, 1871. So I'll wrap up. These African Americans turned their face to the son of emancipation with great expectation. Many of them had achieved their dreams of freedom or were on their way to doing so when the men came for them. Testimonies such as theirs, I think, document the pillaging of some African Americans' freedom. Given the degree of suffering witnesses experienced months and even years after they were attacked, I think it is fair to believe survivor statements that they worried that nothing could repair what the white men broke. In Kara Walker's 2012 portrayal of Reconstruction atrocities, the moral arc of history serves, I think, as a fitting representation of the consequences of the, American, of the original American sin of slavery. Emancipation bent American history towards justice. Hatred for African Americans, however, curved it back towards the barbarity of night riding. That violence dissipated for a time, 
only to be followed by the lynchings, assassination of civil rights activists resisting Jim Crow. It bent again towards justice, towards history, uh, with the civil rights revolution, only to curve back around to the killings of unarmed African Americans by police and vigilantes, and the 2015 slaughter of six African American women and three African American men participating in a Bible study in Charleston. Knowing how Reconstruction's atrocities affected not only the politics of the nation, which is what historians tend to focus on when they talk about night writing, but knowing how it altered the lives of African Americans is the only way we can preserve this history and understand the difficulties these African Americans face fulfilling their visions of freedom. Thank you. I'm going to jump in here, and I will say that our speakers have said that you know, if other folks have questions, we can talk a little bit more. But what I want to pause to do is to acknowledge some of our community partners here who do a lot of this work in our contemporary community. So that, sure, yes, that'd be great. Uh, so that they can introduce themselves, the work that they're doing, and maybe take just a couple of minutes to speak on some of these topics. All right, so I'm actually going to start with a question of veterans with our colleagues from the Virginia Veterans and Family Support who have been here tonight. Uh, good evening, my name is Matt Rolston. I'm a, uh, I work for the Virginia Veteran and Family Support. It's a part of the Depart Department of Veteran Services here in Virginia, so we're a state-run organization. I was born and raised in Richmond, went to JMU, and then was starting my career when 9-11 happened. Um, at that time, I thought it was my duty to serve, so I joined the Army uh, Infantry. Because I had college and, and did well on my little entrance exam, I could have done anything. I knew what the infantry meant. I joined anyway. And so I was a grunt with the 101st Airborne, and I went to Iraq. When I came back, a lot of things happened over there. When I came back, I was pretty much in my house for about two years, and um, I would leave every once in a while to go to Walmart at like 3 in the morning, grab some stuff, go back stay at my house. Uh, it came to a point where I needed help. And one of the organizations that ended up helping me was Virginia Veteran Family Support. And I eventually got a job with them, so pretty cool. Um, now I'm a peer counselor. Uh, I assist veterans who have uh, mental health issues like traumatic brain injury, which I uh, have, and uh, PTSD. So it's real fun talking in front of people. Uh, I have a good time with that's. It's OK, you can laugh. This is, this is uh, hell. but. But at that time when I was in my house, uh, I, I wasn't talking to anyone. I was at a point where I couldn't deal with people at all. So here I am talking to you guys. And, but anyway, um, our organization helps veterans. And, and the reason I was talking about myself is that I'm like one of their success stories. But that's what we do. We help veterans with just about anything and their family members. It's interesting y'all brought up family. It's pretty cool. Um, we're one of the few that, that assist the whole, uh, that fill out that whole process of, of not just the veteran but the family members as well. And one unique thing about us is if a veteran was discharged other, in other than honorable uh, reasons, uh, they're not allowed to go to the VA for services for the most part. So we find other avenues for them to, to get help out in their community. Um, so we're statewide. Uh, we provide support groups, counseling, and uh, assistance with real world issues like employment, housing, things like that. So we're pretty much running the gamut. Uh, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And I'm going to ask our colleagues from the YWCA of Richmond to come up and just say a few words. Thank you all so much. This has been such a great evening. Um, for 130 years, the YWCA of Richmond has been helping to meet the needs of the community. For over 100 years, we've been providing affordable child care for people coming to the city to work. And while I sit here today and I hear about trauma and I hear about power and I hear about violence, I think about our work for the last 40 years, which has been to, sur to support survivors of intimate partner violence and sexual violence across the community, across the region. I think of the 5,000 calls we get every year to the Greater Richmond Regional Hotline where we connect survivors to resources, we connect family members, 
allied professionals to all the resources around the community to help people who've experienced this type of violence. I think about the 450 hospital accompaniment visits that our volunteers and staff do when somebody has experienced violence and needs a helping hand during a forensic exam at all the area hospitals. I think about the thousands of hours of um, counseling that our licensed clinical social workers provide to survivors to heal from trauma. I think about the thousands of high school and college students who learn about healthy relationships and how to intervene when someone who their peer is experiencing an unhealthy relationship. And I also think about the all of the survivors in the community and all that we have to learn about resilience, about the grit and all of the, the work that our survivors work so hard every day to overcome in our community. So I have um, lots of information about our regional collaborative work at the table, and I invite you um, to come by and, and get some resources, pass them on, leave them around, whatever. You never know who's experiencing this type of violence and where they could, um, how they could access our services and, and get that needed help. So thank you so much. Um, this has been a terrific evening, and I thanks for being a part. Thank you. And I'm next going to call on our colleagues from just up the hill at the Virginia War Memorial. Well, good evening. My name is Rob Paler. As has been mentioned, I am from the Virginia War Memorial right up the hill. If the trees were not in the way, you could see it. And uh, we, too, are a part of the Virginia Department of Veterans Services. We were chartered in the late 40s after World War II. Our original charter was to be become a memorial for Virginians specifically. So in a sense, we're exclusive. But that was, a, that was and remains today our charter. Virginians lost and never came home again as a result of enemy action. By the time it was actually built, Korea had come and gone. So Korea was included. Later, Vietnam the Persian Gulf, and more recently, various other things that have happened. Our charter is to memorialize, give honor, thanks, and preserve the memory of those people, and to recognize all veterans, Virginians or not, uh, who have ever served. I am a retired Navy helicopter pilot, and through all of that, we attempt to instill a feeling of patriotism. So that's what we are. We are, in the last 10 years, we have become much more than just a static memorial on a beautiful piece of real estate that many people would love to get their hands on because the view from our plaza is pretty dramatic. And uh, if you haven't come to see us, please do. But come in the next four to six weeks because construction is going to begin on the next phase, at which time... Parking is going to be a little more complicated. Plus, that's when it just plain gets hot. Yes, ma'am. We are almost doubling our square footage. We are more than tripling our parking via a three-level parking deck. We are adding an additional shrine. And as much as possible, it will be identical to the one that exists now without the statue that we call memory. Um, we already have more than 300 names that will be moved from indoors to that shrine once it's complete, and it will provide a place. As long as people have existed, there has been conflict. And as sad as that is, it's a reality. It will provide a place going forward. Long, Hopefully, we're building it in a way that it will be a 500-year building at least, so long after we are gone, it'll still be there, and there will be future generations, if we do our education job correctly, who still honor it, preserve it, and carry it forward. Thank you.
And our fourth partner for the event has been the Black Minds Matter Project at VCU. So I'm going to call them up, and they're going to talk for just a couple minutes. Um, so I'm a recent graduate from VCU, um, and I've been a part of the Black Minds Matter Project um, since like August or something like that. Um, but uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Tanisha White, also a recent grad, and um, yeah, we've all been a part of the Black Minds Matter Project since its, its, since its origination. Do you um, want me to just stop the yeah. talk about the project? Yeah, go ahead. How it happened. So basically, um, hi everyone, my name is Brittany Maddox. I am like, hi everyone, my name is Brittany Maddox. I'm also a grad from um, VCU as well. So basically, uh, the Black Minds Matter Project was conceptualized last summer after the um, con uh, cons uh, the shooting of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. And um, so I'm not unfamiliar with like uh, hyper visibility of like black people after like a shooting, but something occurred to me that I noticed, had been noticing every time that like a shooting or something occurred is that all my friends were tired and we're like why are we all tired about something that's not really directly happening to us but you know we see it everywhere so when i um started like asking my professors i'm like why are like me and like other black students feeling like fatigue my uh boss and one of my professors is like oh that's racial battle fatigue and i'm like oh okay i didn't know what that was but basically racial battle fatigue is like something that um, people of color experience after a tragedy happens to, you know, like their particular community. So I was like, I had prior uh, organizing and activist skills and I also worked at my school's Office of Multicultural Student Affairs. So I was just like, well, maybe we could have a bunch of events or whatever. So I just started um, finding other students that were invested in the cause and it just kind of happened like that. So we had a three day summit um, last March, but mostly we're an interdisciplinary project focusing on black mental health in the age of Black Lives Matter. But we're just looking to expand not only to Richmond City, but also to other um, campuses. So um, we're gonna skip past some of the slides that we had. Um, a lot of it's been talked about already, so we don't wanna. Yeah, you know. we don't wanna pollute. Um, but the main thing that we're talking about is intergenerational trauma, and that's um, how we connect to the Civil War. Um, because a lot of times when we talk about the Civil War, it's just about the people who were directly affected, um, but there are still communities that are still um, dealing with the aftermath even several decades later. Um, and there's just, um, oh, and at the end, we can, there's a sign up sheet over there if you guys want to see the entire PowerPoint, so I don't have to sit here and read everything to you. Um, so one of the things, like Brittany said, that we focus on is uh, mental health. Um, so some of the lasting effects are seen in our black community that way. Um, there are higher levels of unreported and untreated mental illnesses. Um, and, um, and there are the, no, did you want to say something? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. Um, and um, you, you want to read? I'm talking a lot. Okay. No, it's okay. Just, I feel like I'm taking over the mic. It's um, just that we're trying to start a dialogue because we know that um, communities of color, both black and non-black have an issue where uh, there's a distrust of medical professionals and then also you just might not have access to medical care so us being college students with prior activism skills you know we didn't talk about our majors but Taylor uh, you studied psychology Taylor studied psychology and criminal justice me and Tanisha and I both studied African-American studies T uh, Tanisha also taught some classes at the local jail and I also had took a writing class in the jail, but my major is like gender studies. So we, when we do this, um, sometimes we can't, like we might not be able to like afford like mental health care, but also like we can use like social media to start the conversation. And so this is like what we do is primarily just start the conversation. So yeah. <laughs> These are just our um, social media and our email if you guys want to reach out and connect. So yeah. <laughs> All right. I want to thank everybody. Thank everybody who came out this evening.
who was a little bit warmer than is probably comfortable. <laughs> but thank you all for coming. In particular, I want to thank Dr. Williams, Dr. Coleman for coming out. I want to thank our four partners, the Virginia Veterans and Family Support, the YWCA of Richmond, the Virginia War Memorial, and the Black Minds Matter Project for not only being here and sharing their work on these intersectional topics, but also helping to spread the word about our event. I want to thank the staff of the museum for all that they have done, all the chairs that they have lifted, and especially thank our sponsor, Hutton and Williams, for underwriting the cost of this program. And again, thank you for coming out to the American Civil War Museum.